Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with pizza sauce. Yes, we've showed this before, but this is the new and improved version. And by new and improved, I mean old and secret. But anyway, I feel like you guys are ready for this now. And here is the top secret formula. So I'm going to start my prep here with a little bit of fresh oregano. Oregano is the signature herb of pizza sauce. So I have some fresh oregano. I'm going to pull the leaves off the stem. And once those are picked, I'm going to go ahead and chop that up. And that is ready to go. All right, in a saucepan, I got some olive oil, a good amount, and a good quality olive oil. I'm going to put that on medium low heat. And I'm going to throw in two anchovy fillets. That's right. There's anchovy in my pizza sauce but not enough where people will be able to identify it. All right, so as soon as the anchovy starts sizzling like that, I'm gonna throw in my minced garlic, very, very finely chopped garlic, and I'm just gonna cook that for about 60 seconds. I do not wanna brown the garlic. After we sizzle the garlic for about a minute, we're gonna to toss in our fresh oregano. At this point, we're gonna turn the heat down as low as it goes. I'm gonna stir in that oregano, and we're gonna cook that in the oil for a couple minutes. I'm gonna throw in some red chili flakes. I like my pizza sauce a little spicy. And then we're going to put in some dry oregano. Now I know we got fresh, but we're also going to use dry because dry herbs and fresh herbs do not have the exact same flavor. All right, so depending on the recipe, sometimes we use one or the other. Here we're going to use both. Okay, so at this point we want to add our tomatoes. And we're using these. San Marzano tomatoes from Italy, the world's best sauce tomato. Without a doubt, San Marzano. All right, make sure they're the real ones from Italy. Some will just say San Marzano style. They're actually from New Jersey. And don't get me wrong, I love New Jersey. I think they should actually make it like a real state. So while I love New Jersey, the San Marzano tomatoes from Italy, far superior. All right, to prep those, we're simply going to throw those in a bowl and use our bare hand to crush them. All right, keep crushing until you have a puree. And if you're thinking, ooh, he's touching the sauce with his bare hands. I don't want to eat that pizza. What do you think we're using to make the pizza dough with? That's right, our bare hands. So relax. All right, you have an immune system. Use it. All right, once the tomatoes are crushed, we're going to add that to our saucepan. If the heat's still on low, turn it up to medium. Give it a stir, and we're going to bring that up to a simmer. And while we wait for that to happen, we're going to add some seasoning, some salt, a little bit of sugar, and some black pepper. We're going to stir that in, and we're going to simmer this. Now there's a big controversy on how long you should cook pizza sauce. Some people say not at all. It should be a raw sauce that just cooks on the pizza. Other people say you should simmer it for hours and hours. Me, I'm neutral, like a Swiss pizzeria. All right, I think you should cook it some, but it doesn't need to be cooked for hours. I simmer mine for about 35, 40 minutes, which I think is just about perfect. And by the way, sometimes we skim oil off the top of sauces, not in this case. That olive oil is part of the sauce, so stir it right in. Do not skim it. Very important to the final product. Now, there's one last top secret trick that I learned from my grandparents where you take a very, very tiny pinch of baking soda, and you stir that in, and what it does theoretically is that soda neutralizes some of the acid, so you can kind of see it foaming up there a little bit, and that's supposed to mellow out the sauce a little bit, make it a little less acidic, and also possibly prevent heartburn. Does it really work? Who knows and who cares? My grandma did it, so I do it, okay? You're gonna taste and adjust for seasoning, and then it's done. So easy, so incredibly delicious. So next time you're making homemade pizza with our homemade pizza dough recipe, you might as well make some pizza sauce too. It's just a really, really tasty, all-purpose pizza sauce recipe. A Little bit spicy, a little garlicky. We have that fresh oregano flavor and a little bit of the dry oregano flavor, which is a little deeper, a little smokier. All right, don't use too much, of course. Pizzas get ruined if there's too much sauce on it. Anyway, there you go. My top secret pizza sauce recipe finally revealed. I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Here is the new and improved no need pizza dough. Here we go. Now one change, don't be scared, but we're going to use the scale for the dry ingredients. Last time we used cups, but weight way more accurate. So I'm going to start with 2 ounces of whole wheat flour, and then 16 ounces of white flour. Ooh, check it out, my cat just walked by. By the way, don't write these down. All the ingredient amounts will be on the site as usual. Then we're going to go with a quarter teaspoon of dry active yeast, a teaspoon and a half of fine salt, quarter teaspoon of sugar, and 2 tablespoons of regular olive oil, and then last but not least, warm, not scalding hot, 
a cup and a half of warm water, like bath water, 90 degrees to 100 degrees, perfect. Now this is a no-knead dough. I didn't say it's a no-stir dough. So we're going to take a spatula and we're going to stir all that together and keep stirring and stirring and stirring for about, I don't know, three or four minutes until you have this. A sticky, kind of firm, but extremely sticky ball of dough that will pull away from the sides of the bowl and it will look exactly like that. All right, we're going to cover that with plastic. I'm going to throw it in the oven with the light on and it's going to sit there, believe it or not, for 18 to 20 hours until it just about doubles in size. Okay, it's going to look like that. It's going to be all bubbly. It's going to smell yeasty. It's going to look pretty cool. All right, so you're going to flour your work surface very well and then use a spatula to scrape it onto the board. And you can see, even though there was really no kneading done, how just beautifully elastic that dough is. Just, it, it's incredible. All that gluten was developed just through sheer time. So we're going to add a little flour to the top, flour our hands, and just pat it down to flatten it out. Get it into like a rectangle shape, only so it's easy to cut into four equal pieces. So this will make like four, eight, or nine inch pieces. Okay, so after you've done that, my favorite part. All right, form it into a ball, put a little extra flour on it, just enough to keep it from sticking. And then we're going to do what I call the rotate, stretch, and tuck. All right, RSAT for short. So you're going to slowly rotate it around in your hands. While you're doing that, you're stretching the dough from the top down underneath, and you're tucking it in the bottom with your fingers. So maybe go around five or six times, although you're going to be tempted to do more because it just feels so incredibly good. I mean, there's nothing that feels as wonderful as fresh, supple pizza dough. If you've never done this before, you have to try it. It's an incredible experience. All right, if you're ready to make pizza now, cover this with a towel, let it sit for 15 minutes, and you're ready to make pizza, or put it in a Ziploc bag and refrigerate it. You can keep it in the fridge two, three days. In fact, some people like it better refrigerated overnight. They say it makes the crust even more tender. So anyway, this is a no-need pizza dough recipe. It's not a pizza-making demo, but I'm gonna show you quickly how I finished. So I'm gonna put a little flour on. Now you can spin it, you can stretch it, you can do it any way you want, but you know what? Just take a roller, put a little flour on, and roll it out. There's no shame. Don't let those pizza snobs tell you you can't use a roller. Like I said, this is going to make about a 9-inch pizza. So I'm going to roll that out. I think this particular dough works better for thin crust than thick, but either way, it'll work. I'm going to take a sheet pan with a little bit of cornmeal, put your dough down, and then don't be an American. And by that, I mean don't put four cups of sauce and seven pounds of cheese on. Just barely enough sauce to cover I'm going to go with some hot pepper flakes, some fresh basil and oregano from my garden, and then, of course, some mozzarella. By the way, if you can grate your mozzarella, it's probably not that good. The good stuff is just too soft and creamy to grate, so this is why you see me with these kind of little cubes. All right, and again, not too much. Good pizza is an exercise in restraint. And I would have done a little light dusting of Parmesan, but I was out, so I didn't. All right, I'm going to use the famous bottom-of-the-oven method. So as high as your oven will go, mine's at 550. I'm going to place the pan right on the bottom of the oven for four minutes, which is going to help crisp up the bottom. I'm going to transfer it to the middle rack for another five or six minutes until it looks like that. Beautifully golden. The bottom will be slightly charred and crispy, or at least it should be. All right, get it off the pan onto a rack so the bottom doesn't get soggy. And let it cool for a couple minutes. Third degree molten cheese burns are not fun. All right, we're going to cut that up and so delicious. That's all there is to making your own pizza dough. And did I mention there's no kneading? There's no kneading. It could not be easier. So if you've never made pizza before, you have to give this a try. Do not be on your deathbed complaining to your relatives, oh, I wish I made pizza. I never made homemade pizza. Come on, while there's time, make some homemade no-need pizza dough. All the ingredients are on the site, so go get the exact measurements. And as always, enjoy. Horrible pizza! That's right, for centuries, chefs have been trying to figure out how to do a pizza dough in liquid form. And while thousands have tried, it's never been successfully done. That is, until today. Well, actually, technically a couple days ago. But the point is, I think I figured it out. So let me go ahead and show you this before I change my mind and trademark it and keep it to myself. Which is probably what I should do, but I bet that's a lot of paperwork. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started by mixing up this game-changing dough. And by dough, I actually mean batter. So into a mixing bowl, I'm gonna add some flour, and I'm actually using a special kind of flour called double zero, which tends to work very nicely for pizza. And of course, I'll give you a little more info about that on the blog post. But I'm pretty sure this will work almost as well with all purpose. 
and then to our flour we'll add one package of dry active yeast. And this time we're not going to start it in warm water like we usually do, since this mixture is going to be so wet. Plus every once in a while I get an email saying you don't have to start modern yeast in water anymore. Come on Chef John, that's so 20th century. Which I guess is true, but I'm a creature of habit. But anyway, for this we can go ahead and dump it right in. And then we can continue on with our classic pizza dough ingredients, which of course would include some salt, as well as a little touch of honey or sugar, although I do prefer the honey. I like to give the local bees a little business. We will also add in a little bit of olive oil, and then we'll finish this up by pouring in our warm water. Ideally, I like this to be about 105 degrees. So we will dump that in, and then of course we're gonna have to mix this up. So by force of habit, I grab my dough hook, and I headed over to the stand mixer, and I started mixing this up with my dough hook attachment. And it didn't really dawn on me until this video was done, but this mixture really was way too thin for the dough hook. I mean, what am I doing here? It's not really mixing in. So in hindsight, obviously the whisk attachment would have worked much better here. But anyway, with the help of a spatula and a few scrape downs, this eventually came together. And once it did, I let it mix for about five or six minutes, at which point it looked like this. Very, very thin. So I took my spatula and cleaned that up a little. And then like all pizza doughs, pourable or otherwise, we're gonna need to let this rise, so to speak. So I covered that with a plate and just left it right on the counter for an hour and a half. And if everything's gone according to plan, you should be looking at one beautifully bubbly batter. So let me go ahead and grab a ladle so you can get a better look at what we got here. And as much fun as this stuff is to look at, it's even more fun to stir with a ladle. So what we'll do is we'll give that a good stir to knock all the bubbles out. Sort of the same idea as if we were working with traditional pizza dough. And then once that's set, we can go ahead and pre-cook our crust, which I'm gonna do in this cast iron pan, which we need to generously grease first with olive oil. And then once our pan has been generously oiled, we can go ahead and pour in our batter. And I really wanted to use a large squeeze bottle for this, but I didn't have one on hand. So all I did was put it in a plastic bag and cut off the corner. And because I'm going for a thin crust here, I found this to be the best method for putting in the batter. I did a few experiments with ladling it and kind of pushing it around or using a spatula to spread it, but it didn't work as well because you're mixing the batter into the oil in the pan, which I don't want to happen. We want our pourable pizza dough on top of the oil. So this is the method I'm recommending. Although as you can see, I did trap a little bit of the oil and I was thinking of fixing that with extra batter, but then I remembered I was making a thin crust and we don't want extra batter. So I grabbed a paring knife and used the old poke and swirl and that is it. We've successfully transferred a very thin layer of our pourable pizza dough into this generously oiled pan. And at this point, we can head to the stove where we're going to cook this over medium high heat. So we'll set that down and we'll just wait. And what we're waiting for is bubbles. Lots of bubbles. Which will start to form slowly. But before you know it, it's going to look like this. And when I first tested this, I was thinking, man, this is going to be much more like a pizza crumpet. So this does look a little strange, but do not be deterred. And all we want to do here is wait for those bubbles to form, and for this thing to kind of dry out enough where it's safe to flip. Which for me was right about here. So I gave that a flip, and I went ahead and I cooked that bubble side for a minute or two, before flipping it back over. Because we really want to concentrate most of this pre-cooking on the crust side. We need somehow to get a nice crispy crust underneath this, otherwise what we're going to be eating is nothing more than a pizza pancake. And do you want to eat a pizza pancake? No, of course you don't. Nobody does. So we really do want to push that smooth, non-bubbly side as far as we can go. I mean, don't burn it, but we do need to get that a little crispy. So anyway, I kept cooking my crust on medium high, flipping it back and forth until it looked like this. The bubbly side was kind of dry to the touch and golden in color. And the bottom looked like, well, a pizza crust. Now, please keep in mind, this is going to go back in the oven with the toppings for a few minutes. So that will actually get a little darker, so please keep that in mind. And then once your pourable pizza crust has been pre-cooked, we can go ahead and finish that with our favorite toppings. So I went ahead and spread over some pizza sauce. And not only do all those little holes look cool, they're also pretty awesome holding your sauce. So I spread over my pizza sauce, and then topped that with some fresh mozzarella, which by the way was way too fresh, which is why I'm crumbling it on. This stuff's more for eating than for pizza, but that's what I had, so I used it. I also decided to add some freshly grated Parmigiano Reggiano, the real stuff. What it lacks in cellulose, it more than makes up for in flavor. And then I finished that off with some hipster farm to table artisan pepperoni, which is exactly the same as the regular pepperoni, except costs twice as much. And of course, as with all pizzas, the toppings are up to you. You are the boss of this pizza dough that pours like a sauce. 
But no matter what you use, don't put on too much. That's the fatal flaw with most bad pizzas. And then once we're happy with our toppings, we can go ahead and finish this in the oven. But don't forget, this is already cooked, except for the toppings. So what I like to do is just put this under the broiler for about three or four minutes. Or if you prefer, you can just do it in a 500 degree oven until everything is heated through and your toppings are cooked. And this is what mine looked like after about four minutes under the broiler. Check it out. Man, that looks good. But looks can be deceiving, so let's eat it to make sure. So I transferred that to a cutting board to slice it up. And unfortunately, my pizza wheel is broken. So I had to use the old Mezzaluna. And please excuse the hairy forearm shot. That is never a good look. But anyway, I cut that up. And I don't know about you, but to me that looks exactly like a thin crust pepperoni pizza. And above and beyond appearances, when you bite into this thing, I really think you're going to be impressed. I mean, of course it's not going to be exactly the same. How could it be? But the final product was very, very good and extremely, extremely pizza-like. And please keep in mind, I've only done this once. So I'm sure with your help, we can continue to advance this technique. But anyway, that's it. Pourable pizza dough. I'm thinking this stuff would be a huge hit with the kids on the next pizza night. Or simply the next time you want pizza, but you don't want to mess around with a traditional pizza procedure and everything that entails. I mean, I enjoy stretching and spinning and especially rolling as much as the next guy. But I also really love this alternative technique. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Cauliflower pizza crust. That's right, if you thought it was impossible to make pizza crust without flour and yeast using only cauliflower, well, you were right, it is impossible. But that's okay. While this is not anything like traditional pizza doughs, it is in its own right a very delicious thing, very nutritious, and as far as appearances goes, produces something that looks remarkably like an awesome pizza. So let me show you how to make this, and to get started, we need to prep our cauliflower. And there it is, one head of cauliflower. This one was a little on the small side, but your standard sized head of cauliflower from the grocery store should work. And to prep, all you're gonna do is cut out the core, and then simply break off those cauliflower florets and throw those into the bowl of your food processor. Although I guess we should call those cauliflowerettes. But nevertheless, we're gonna break that up into our food processor. And then, you know what's coming next. We're gonna process this until it's finely ground. And of course, as physics and tradition would dictate, you wanna start by pulsing on and off, and then you wanna continue processing that until it's very, very, very finely ground. Oh, and by the way, in the cauliflower pizza crust subculture, they actually refer to this as cauliflower rice, which I guess I can see. But since we are making pizza crust with this, I prefer cauliflower flour. But anyway, our cauliflower is prepped and it's time to dump that into some kind of saute pan or anything that will go on the stove along with a splash of water. And we're gonna put that on medium high heat and we're gonna cook that for about five or six minutes. So basically the game plan here is we need to cook this cauliflower and then squeeze out as much water liquid as possible because that's the only way you're gonna get a pizza crust made out of this stuff that's firm enough to stay together that you can actually lift up and bite like a slice. And of course, like any kind of vegetable cookery, we're gonna need enough salt. So you saw me throw in a big pinch of salt there, and I'm gonna give that a stir. And like I said, we're gonna cook that for about five or six minutes, at which point we're gonna turn off the heat and then simply let it cool. You can leave it right on the stove, but if you're in a hurry, like I always am, you could go ahead and throw that in front of an open window and it will cool a lot faster. Just watch out for bears. But anyway, let your cauliflower flour cool down and then we're gonna go ahead and transfer that into the center of a clean napkin. And raise your hand if you were gonna use a dirty napkin until you heard me say that. See, that's exactly the kind of obvious tip you do not get on the other channels. And once that's been transferred, go ahead and gather up the corners and start squeezing. And you're gonna see just a massive amount of water coming out of there. In fact, so massive, you may not wanna squeeze it on the cutting board. Let me grab the pan here, squeeze it into that. And I mean squeeze with all your might. In fact, if you have little wimpy spaghetti arms, have a friend give you a hand. You know that friend of yours that wears the half shirts? He's perfect for this. But anyway, somehow, someway, squeeze all the water out. Because as I mentioned earlier, this really is the key step. And if you do it right, you should be left with something that looks like this. And I know it doesn't look that great, but it's cauliflower. What'd you expect? So at that point, go ahead and transfer that into a mixing bowl. And we'll add the rest of the ingredients. The first of which would be some cayenne pepper. So a little shake of that. After that, we'll do some freshly and finely grated Parmigiano-Reggiano. Except no substitutes. And then we're gonna throw in a little chunk of fresh goat cheese. I know you didn't see that one coming, along with one egg. And since we put our salt in earlier, that is gonna do it. So we're gonna take a spatula and mix that up extremely thoroughly. And you'll see, by the time you're done mixing, you should have something that looks and feels like that. And it should be very, very pressable. And you'll know for sure when you move on to the next step. 
So we're going to go ahead and line a baking sheet with some parchment paper. The parchment paper is critical. I'll talk about that on the blog, but you have to have parchment paper. And then just go ahead and take your cauliflower mixture, kind of wad it up into a dough ball, and I totally did the air quotes around dough, and place that in the center of your parchment paper. And then we're going to go ahead and press that out to about a quarter inch thick. And just some damp fingers will work, but I like to go ahead and throw a piece of plastic down and use that to help press. And once we have that pressed out into a nice, even, round shape that, like I said, is about a quarter inch thick, maybe a hair thicker, maybe three-eighths, that's pretty much ready. Although there is one optional step if you want to go around the outside, around the outside, around the outside with your fingers and kind of create like a simulated pizza crust edge. Go ahead. I did it. I think it looks nicer when it's done, but suit yourself. But anyway, once your cauliflower pizza crust is shaped, it's time to bake. And what we're going to do is we're going to throw that in the center of a preheated 400 degree oven for about 40 minutes or until it looks like this. Check that out. That kind of looks like a pizza crust. And as we'll talk about later, that's kind of where the similarities end. But anyway, what we're going to do at this point is let it cool down just a little because what we're going to do is go ahead and flip this over. All right, this brown side is a little firmer, a little less moist than the underside. So what we'll do is we'll just flip it over. And this is sort of the first test. If you did everything right, it should totally hold together. And at that point, you're ready to build your pizza. And I know you know how to do this, but I'm going to show you how I did mine. I started with a little bit of our famous pizza sauce recipe. Just a little, not too much. It's just like regular pizza. You'll wreck it if you put too much sauce. And then after my sauce, I did a little bit of red pepper flake and then some beautiful diced fresh mozzarella. You know we're not crazy about the kind you can actually grate. So try to find fresh mozzarella. Next up, I went with a few thin slices of pepperoni. Although to be honest, it wasn't really pepperoni. It was some kind of spicy artisan hipster salami, but it worked good. I'm also going to do a little pinch of oregano. And then last but not least, a light dusting of Parmesan. And then that's ready for the oven, which by the way, I've raised to 450. All right, so as you're prepping your pizza, go ahead and turn your oven up to 450. And once your pizza has been topped to your satisfaction, we're going to go ahead and pop that in for about 10 to 12 minutes or until it looks like this. And you got to admit, that looks like one killer pizza pie. And yes, the edges of the crust are going to kind of crisp up a little bit, crust up a little bit. And then just because I was concerned about moisture, I did let this cool for about five minutes on a wire rack. I think that kind of lets the bottom dry out a little bit as it cools. And then I went ahead and slid it on the cutting board. I grabbed my trusty pizza cutter and we cut that up. And if you didn't know any better, you'd swear you were just about to bite into the most delicious pizza you've ever had. Which brings us to the key point. Make sure you know better. Because while this looks exactly like pizza... And as I pick it up, it kind of feels exactly like pizza. If you're actually going to compare this to a wheat and yeast based pizza dough, you will be sorely, sorely disappointed. So if you're going to serve this, this is a classic example of managing expectations. Don't tell people they're coming over for pizza. Tell them they're coming over for cauliflower. And that way there's no way they'll be disappointed. Because if you think you're having cauliflower for dinner and you get this, you're pretty psyched. And of course, I've been talking mostly about texture here. The taste is much closer. I mean, there is definitely a little bit of roasted cauliflower flavor in the background, but it is fairly subtle. And all in all, I think it makes a great and obviously significantly healthier delivery system for pizza toppings. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Spelt Pizza. That's right, don't let those amazing toppings fool you. This is all about the crust and my attempt to create a non-white flour pizza dough that isn't horrible. And while I'm no health nut, I think these days everybody agrees that reducing the amount of highly processed, refined white flour is a good idea. Except, of course, your grandparents. They're like, you kids these days are crazy. Our generation ate it all our lives. And other than all these major illnesses, we turned out just fine. And if you've never seen it before, this is what spelt flour looks like. Looks pretty much exactly like a light whole wheat flour, but as far as texture and taste go, it's actually pretty different. And as you'll read about on the blog, it has some great nutritional advantages. It's higher in protein and easier to digest, just to name a few. In fact, some people who can't eat regular flour because of the gluten can actually eat this without the same ill effects. So we'll cover all that stuff on the blog. But for now, what we're going to do is put one cup of that into a mixing bowl, to which we'll add our dry active yeast, followed by a little touch of honey, and then finally some very, very warm but not too hot water. And what we're doing here is like a quick little sponge step. We want to make sure our yeast is alive, and we'll give those little microorganisms a little head start before we add the rest of the ingredients. So all we need to do is mix that up and let it sit for about 20 minutes, 
after which it should look like this. And if it doesn't, your yeast was dead, or you killed it with too hot water. But as you can see here, my yeast colony was growing quite nicely. So at this point, we'll add the rest of the ingredients. And because we're making pizza dough, that's going to include salt, as well as a little splash of olive oil, and then, of course, the rest of the flour. And by rest, I mean like 90% of what I call for. Never add all the flour called for in a dough recipe. Hold a little bit out and see if you actually need it while you need it. But anyway, we're going to add that spelt flour in, and then I'm going to head over to the mixer, where we're going to knead this for a while with our dough hook attachment. Yes, dough hook attachment. And it was right about here when I realized, hey, that's not the dough hook attachment. That's the whisk. So I stopped it and switched them out. And believe me, it was very tempting to be stubborn and leave that whisk on there because it was already dirty. But then I remembered the old saying, there are good cooks and there are stubborn cooks, but there are no good stubborn cooks. So I did the right thing, attached the dough hook, and kneaded that for about three or four minutes until I had a very soft, slightly elastic, and tacky but not sticky dough. So let me transfer that to the table so you can get a better look. Like I said, very soft and smooth, springs back a little bit to the touch. And when it comes to pizza dough, you always want to err on the side of a little too sticky versus a little too dry. Okay, this one could have been a touch wetter. All right, it was just right there. But as you'll see, it worked fine. So what we want to do is work that into a nice smooth dough ball. And we'll transfer it back into our mixing bowl. And we'll rub the surface with a little bit of olive oil so it doesn't dry out while it rises. Because that is the next step. We're going to cover that and hopefully place it in a nice, warm, draft-free place. I like to use a turned-off oven for about an hour and a half or until it's doubled in size, which is what I have right here. And at this point, we can punch it down and start making our individual pizza doughs. So let's go ahead and transfer that onto our work surface. And we'll press that down with our hands to deflate it completely. And then I'm going to cut this in quarters. I think this recipe makes four personal size pizzas. So let's divide up our dough. And then each of those sections, you're going to form into another little dough ball. Just like that, doesn't really matter too much. We're going to roll it out. But a round shape with a smooth top is generally a good idea. And I'm just going to test one here. I'm going to put the other three in the fridge. And I will give instructions on the post if you do make this ahead and refrigerate it. But anyway, what we need to do before we make pizza is let these individual dough balls rest and rise for about 30 to 45 minutes at room temperature. So you can use a towel if you want. I like to cover it with a bowl. And like I said, we're going to let that sit for at least 30 minutes or so. It's probably not going to double in size. But it's definitely going to puff up, and at this point, finally, we can make pizza. So let's go ahead and put a little flour down on our surface, and then we need to press, stretch, spin, or roll this into our desired thickness. So I like to use a rolling pin for this, and just enough flour so it won't stick. And I'm going to roll that out till it's about an eighth to a quarter inch thick. All right, something like this. And then once our dough is stretched and or rolled out to the desired thickness, I'm going to lightly sprinkle one side with cornmeal because I think that's going to give this more of the feel of a traditional pizza dough. And it's also going to help it avoid sticking. So I guess that's optional. You are the dexter of your pizza crust texture. So it's up to you to decide what will make the most killer pizza. And once I've pressed that cornmeal in, I'm going to transfer that into a cast iron pan, cornmeal side down, and proceed to add the toppings, which is going to start with some pizza sauce. And I should have mentioned at the beginning, this video also includes a game-changing method for cooking pizza using one of these cast iron pans. And while this will work for any dough, I think it works particularly well with these kind of whole grain doughs. But anyway, you're gonna see that in a minute. For now, let me finish topping my pizza. And on this particular day, I went with spicy sausage, sauteed mushrooms, sauteed red onion. I'm also gonna dot it all over with some nice fresh mozzarella, as well as a generous dusting of real Parmesan cheese. And we'll finish up with a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. And that pizza's ready to cook. So what we'll do is we'll place that pan on medium high heat, for about five or six minutes before putting it in the oven. One of the problems with homemade pizza, especially, especially using a whole grain dough, is that kind of soggy crust. You just don't get that same crisp brown bottom that you would get from that super hot professional pizzeria oven. So basically all this technique is is sort of a cheat to achieve that before it goes in the oven. And what's gonna happen is that heat's gonna come up through the bottom, it's gonna start cooking that dough. In fact, you're gonna see it sort of rise around the edge. And when we see the edges of the crust puffing and the sauce is bubbling, and we take a peek and we can see that bottom is starting to brown up. At this point, it's ready to finish in a very hot oven or under the broiler until our toppings are done, which should take you less than five minutes. So I popped mine in, I pulled it out, and I was looking at one extremely gorgeous pizza. So I'm gonna go ahead and transfer that to a rack to cool for just a couple minutes. And while I'm waiting, let me give you one more peek underneath and you'll be able to see that totally non-soggy crust. So yes, this video is officially how to make a spelt pizza dough, but I really do love this cast iron technique. So I let my pizza cool a few minutes, at which point we'll transfer it onto a plate. 
And because I used that nice, fatty, spicy Italian sausage, I decided to top mine with a little baby arugula salad. So, you know, they cancel each other out. And I highly suggest you put your salad on before you cut it because it makes it so much harder and more awkward. But anyway, I cut that up and I closed my eyes and I took a bite and it was very, very pizza-like. And of course, it's going to be different than a white flour pizza. But compared to other whole grain wheat flours, this is much lighter, much more tender. The bottom and edges had a beautiful crispiness to them. And the flavor is actually quite mild. And how I know this worked very well is I was eating this, I wasn't thinking about the crust. I was just enjoying a good tasting pizza. But anyway, that's it. Even if you're not into a new and exciting whole grain dough, at the very least, hopefully you try that very cool cast iron pan technique. All right, so I really do hope you give these things a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Wolfgang Puck's pizza dough recipe. His famous California pizza dough. And you know Wolfgang Puck. He's that chef that's always doing the Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. Wolfgang recently let me publish this on my American food site on about.com. So I'm going to show you how to make it. Really, really easy and really nice dough. I was impressed. So you're going to start with one package of dry active yeast. A teaspoon of honey. I'm using sage honey. You use any honey you want. A quarter cup of warm water, like really warm, like 105 degrees. Very important it's warm. Give it a stir. Let it dissolve for 10 minutes. Then we're going to add our salt, olive oil, three quarters of a cup of equally warm water, 105 degrees, and a cup of flour. You're going to stir that up. It's going to become a batter. We're going to add another cup of flour, stir that in, and then we're going to add even more flour. So this is going to get about three cups total. But what we're going to do is we're going to add two and a half cups at this point. It's going to get too thick to stir, and then you're going to move to the board and maybe knead in the rest of the flour. So when it gets too annoying to stir, see right there, you're like, God, this is so annoying. Then you're going to turn it out onto the board. You're going to sprinkle maybe a quarter cup of flour down, and then you're going to knead this with the traditional kneading smushing it with your palm method for about five minutes till we have a smooth, fairly firm, but nice and smooth, slightly, very slightly sticky dough. So this took just about all three cups. All right, so two and a half cups went into the actual dough in the bowl, and then I kept kneading it, and you see it actually picked up all the flour on the board. So it was just about three cups of flour. You gotta play it by ear. But there we go, a nice, smooth, fairly firm dough. A Little bit of olive oil in a bowl, just rinse out the bowl you mixed it in, all right? Coat it with olive oil, just a little bit. Put a damp towel over it and let it sit in a warm place. I turned the oven on for about five minutes, turned it off so it was nice and warm. It's gonna go a half hour to 40 minutes and it's gonna basically almost double in size, all right? And that looks pretty good. Turn it out onto your floured cutting board, pat it down with your hand that deflates it. And we're gonna make four small pizzas with this. So I'm going to cut it in four pieces. Now the last step here, I'm going to do this twice for you. Take one of those quarters and just keep folding the outsides down and under. And the top kind of stretches out. So you're just kind of going around. You're folding up underneath. You do that about six or seven times, and that's ready. All right, one more time. Take a piece. Okay, you're kind of turning it. You can use your fingertips or your palms. You're just kind of stretching it down and under and then tucking it up underneath. Anyway, just watch that a few times. It's not that hard. We're going to put those on a tray. All right, we're going to cover that with a towel and let that sit in a warm place for 20 minutes to a half hour. And then you're ready to make pizza. Now what you want to do here, put it down on a lightly floured board. Start in the center with your fingertips and just kind of keep pressing out. This is only going to get about, you know, 8 or 10 inches wide. But that'll make a nice kind of rim around the edge to give it that kind of signature California pizza look. All right, so I just kept stretching, pulling. You can roll it if you want. There's not a big difference if you roll it. All right, pizza makers get all upset if you roll it. So stretch it out. I'm going around the edge with my fingertip to kind of make that crust shape. Now, it goes on a cornmeal pan. All right, pan with a good amount of cornmeal. Brush it with some extra virgin olive oil. All right, that kind of seals the pizza from the sauce. We're gonna put sauce on, but not too much, just a couple tablespoons. Spread it around, a very light shaking of red pepper flakes for me, 
And then here's where you got to just control yourself. A very light cheesing. A little bit of mozzarella, a little bit of fontina, and I just did a really light sprinkling of parmesan. And then you put it whatever other toppings you want here. I didn't have any other toppings, so I'm just making a cheese pizza. It's going to go on the bottom of a 450 degree oven for five minutes. All right, after five minutes, move it to the middle rack of your oven for another four or five minutes until it looks like that. I should have a pizza stone, but I don't. But it actually works nice on the bottom of the oven. The bottom gets really crispy. And then I tried this. Wolfgang, I got to hand it to you, buddy. That's a good pizza dough. Okay, so it was kind of chewy, very tender. You, this works if you roll it out really thin. It works if you like a thicker pizza crust, up to you. So anyway, that's Wolfgang Puck's California pizza dough. The extra pizza dough, just put in Ziploc bags. You can keep it two, three days in the fridge. I hope you give it a try. All the amounts are on the site. And as always, enjoy. How to reheat old soggy leftover pizza. No, we're not going to use the oven. We're going to use a stovetop method that is so far superior, it's not even funny. All right, so here we go. We have our leftover pizza. It was delicious, but now it's soft and soggy and limp and floppy. So step one, we're gonna put a dry, large skillet on medium heat. I'm gonna place my pizza slices in the pan. Now there will be enough residual oil to crisp this up, so don't add any olive oil or anything to the pan. And basically what's gonna happen, the heat's gonna crisp up the bottom of the crust, and by the time the crust is crispy, the heat will have come up through the cheese and actually reheated the toppings just right. All right, to aid in that, we're gonna make a little cover by folding foil sort of into a circular shape that will fit the pan, and that's gonna keep just enough heat in without trapping too much steam, which is the enemy of crispy crust. So we just want this loosely covered. Now, of course, you're gonna to have to experiment on time in your kitchen, but for me, it's about four to five minutes on medium, and I will have a crispy crust and a hot surface. All right, can you hear that? When the bottom's crisp, and it sounds like that, and the top is hot, yes, I just burned my finger. Take it out and enjoy. And I have to say, I really think you're gonna be blown away at how amazing this works. So let me grab a fork here. No, not to eat it with. I'm not a communist. I wanna use the fork to show you how amazing this works. Listen to this. Come on, that is better, better than when it was delivered or when you ordered it in the restaurant, okay? And then to add insult to injury, you have to listen to me bite into it. Oh yeah. And by the way, this works so well, you don't even have to wait for pizza to be left over. I'll actually do this to pizza that just got delivered so I have that fresh out of the oven crust effect. Anyway, head over to foodwishes.com. There's no ingredients, but there's a blog post there as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.